Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of Echoes Journal Club, a new series in which I will present semi-formal reviews of academic literature on a specific empirical question on various socioeconomic topics. Compared to my usual content, Journal Club videos will be simpler, narrower, and drier, with a complete focus on the academic literature surrounding a topic. And with that, let's introduce our first topic, Echoes Journal Club number one. Are Americans economically better or worse off than 40 years ago, and why? If you're at all interested in politics, you've almost certainly seen some variation of this chart circulating around the internet. The most common version, put out by the left-wing economic policy institutes, claims that since the 1980s American workers have seen their wages largely stagnate, even as productivity has continued to rise. This is often paired with a more general narrative about rising inequality and economic precarity in the United States. Of course, this narrative is not uncontested. The right-wing Heritage Foundation has responded with their own research suggesting that compensation has kept up with productivity, for example. Surface-level data is also somewhat mixed. FRED, the national gold standard for economic data run by the Federal Reserve, reports an unsteady but significant increase in real which means inflation-adjusted, U.S. median household income since 1984. But other measures of economic well-being, like the poverty rate, don't seem to be consistently decreasing, even as real per capita GDP has increased rapidly. To figure out what's actually going on, I've assembled eight academic articles and a congressional report from the last decade to get to the bottom of this question. To keep things moving, I'll refer to all papers by their authors. You can find full titles and links in the description. In part 1, we will identify whether Americans are better or worse off than they used to be, and in part 2, we will review some potential causes for the changes identified in the literature. Let's get started. Let's start with some surface-level statistics. First of all, Fred reports that real per capita GDP nearly doubled between 1980 and 2020, from $30,000 to $57,000. All else held equal, we should expect individual income to approximately double as well. Data from Fred confirms that the average hourly wage has increased steadily in the United States, from about $680 an hour in 1980 to nearly $24 an hour at the start of 2020, though these figures are not adjusted for inflation. Data from the Social Security Administration shows a steady increase in average wages, while data from the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank confirms that median wage growth has hovered between 2 and 5% annually since 1998, compared to an average rate of inflation of just over 2%. So far, so good. Things seem to be getting better. However, almost none of our studies actually look at averages, and for good reason. Income in the United States is heavily skewed, with lots of extremely high income earners, which skews averages upwards. Median wages are usually a better representation of what the typical American experience is. Indeed, you may have noticed that the Social Security Administration notes a much lower growth in median wages than average wages. Let's have a look at these trends in a bit more detail. The Congressional Research Service, or CRS, a US government agency, reports wage trends for median workers as well as those in the 10th and 90th percentiles, that is to say, those near the bottom and those near the top of the income distribution, adjusted for inflation, between 1980 and 2020. They report that over the last four decades, real median wages grew by only 8.8% total, and wages near the bottom grew by even less. Only wages near the top grew substantially, with the 90th percentile wage increasing by over 40%. Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman break down the U.S. population into similar groups, and find that while average adult real income did grow by about 60% between 1980 and 2014, average real income actually stagnated completely for the bottom 50%, remaining at around $16,000 a year in today's dollars. If this estimate sounds low to you, keep in mind that it includes all adults, including the retired, students, and unemployed, which still matter. Pre-tax income for the bottom 20% of Americans actually collapsed by about 25% over this period, and even after taxation and redistribution, their incomes only grew by about 4%. Across the same period, 
pre-tax income only increases by 7% for the next 30% of Americans, what we can call the lower middle class, and even for those above average Americans, those in the next 50%, pre-tax income only goes up by about 42%. Again, keep in mind that this is over a period where real per capita GDP nearly doubles. In fact, the authors report that for the bottom 87% of Americans, income grew slower than the economy overall. And as I'm sure you're all familiar with, income at the top explodes. Contrast this with the period from 1945 to 1980, when real income more than doubles for those near the bottom. Several studies also break down the results by education. The CRS confirms the common narrative of divergence between those with and without college degrees. Since 1980, the median college graduate has seen real wages increase by 15%, while those without have seen real median wages decline by about 11%. But the story is more complicated than this. Even among college graduates, growth is heavily skewed at the top, with the 90th percentile seeing wages rise by over 40%, while the 10th percentile's wages barely grew at all. This story is even more dramatic when we break it out into more specific education categories. Those with no high school diploma, those that just graduated high school, and those with some college all saw their real wages decline. However, even among bachelor's graduates, wages only grew modestly by about $2 from 1980 to 2000, and then almost completely flatline. Only those with advanced degrees saw consistent wage growth, and even that slows down after about 2000. Breaking it out by gender, there is some good news. Wages for women have generally grown robustly since 1980, with even the bottom 10th percentile seeing about 10% real wage growth and the median female wage increasing by nearly 30%, leading to a closing of the gender gap, though this has been stagnating in recent years. However, median male wages actually declined by about 3% over the same period, and the loss was more than double that for the lowest earning men. This suggests that a large part of rising median incomes is just women catching up with men, rather than any general improvement. This is confirmed by a figure in Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman, which shows overall labor income increasing on par with rising female wages, while male pay stagnates or even drops. This holds up when we break things up by education and gender. Autor, Katz, and Kearney report that female wages rose regardless of educational status since 1960, while male wages saw a lot more dispersion based on how educated they were. In fact, since 1970, men without college degrees overall see their wages drop. Breaking down results by age also generates some interesting results. Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman report that after-tax income for the bottom 50% of Americans has increased by a modest 21% since 1980, for example. However, all of the growth in post-tax bottom 50% income owes to the increase in income for the elderly whose post-tax income grew by a whopping 70% over this period. Exclude the retired, and even post-redistribution incomes for the bottom 50% barely budge at all. Purcell breaks this down in more detail, looking at male wage trends by birth cohort, and finds that for those turning 25 in 2010, real wages were actually lower than they were in 1981, or for that matter lower than they were in 2000. The author looks at wages for men in their late 50s as well, and curiously finds that unlike in the past, when real median wages dropped as people began to retire, older American men saw barely any income drop at all in the early 2010s, suggesting they are working longer than ever before, possibly to the detriment of the youngest. Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman confirmed this, finding that since the Great Recession, the only age group that's seen any substantial after-tax income growth were those more than 65 years old. Looking at wages and income is all well and good, but we're still missing a piece of the puzzle. Recall that Heritage Foundation diagram from earlier. In contrast to the EPI graph, they report compensation, not just wages. So what about the other half of compensation, worker benefits? Crystal, Cohen, and Navot report that the average hourly real compensation has grown roughly threefold since 1982, albeit with some important compositional changes. Pension plans are now much less common compared to 401ks and other defined contribution plans, and paid vacations and holidays are also less commonly offered, though sick leave and bonuses are somewhat more common today. Employer health insurance coverage has also declined, 
from 87% in 1982 to only 77% in 2015, and that's half a decade after the passage of Obamacare. As before, however, averages obscure what is actually going on. The authors find that benefit growth is actually even more skewed between the richest and the poorest workers than wage growth, with benefit inequality between the best and most poorly paid workers nearly three times as high as wage inequality. As a result, by 2015, a worker in the 10th percentile, who earns about $9 an hour, only received 30 cents of benefits an hour while a worker in the 90th percentile earned $52 in wages but also received $22 in benefits per hour. While average compensation has gone up, nearly all of the increase in benefits, as with wages, is going to the top. We should also note that health insurance has grown as a proportion of compensation, more than doubling between 1982 and 2015, suggesting that at least part of the growth in compensation is soaked up by rising healthcare costs. This actually applies to government health programs, like Medicaid and Medicare, as well. Earlier, I note that Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman report post-tax incomes of the bottom 50% increasing somewhat. However, when they break up by benefit type, we can see that nearly all growth in the bottom 50% post-tax income has come from health transfers. Since we also know that most growth has accrued to the retired, we can reasonably assume that most of this growth is coming from Medicare benefit expansion. Exclude this, and bottom 50% income is barely higher today than it was in the late 70s, even after redistribution. Let's summarize our results. Since 1980, average incomes and compensation have gone up significantly, overall by about 60% according to one estimate. However, this is largely due to high incomes skewing the averages. Breaking down into percentiles, we find that the bottom half of Americans have seen almost no growth in income at all over the last 40 years, with the bottom 20% actually seeing large income drops. Redistribution improves this somewhat, but most of that currently goes to the retired and to cover rising healthcare costs. What improvement we have seen largely comes from women catching up to men rather than any general improvement. And when looking at educational status, we find that bachelor's degree holders have seen wages increase slowly and then stagnate, while everyone with less education has seen outright declines in income. Overall, this is a pretty ugly picture. This begs the question, if per capita GDP has nearly doubled over the last four decades, why are so many Americans doing worse today? Let's look at the evidence. As I hope is now clear, inequality seems to be at the heart of the problem. The economy is growing a lot, but it's all going to a small segment of the population at the very top. But the research suggests that this story is more complex than simply the rich getting richer and everybody else falling by the wayside. The overall trend in income inequality since 1980 can actually be decomposed into several different overlapping trends over time. Autor, Katz, and Kearney report that at first, 50-10 inequality, the inequality between the 10th and the 50th income percentile, spiked rapidly. That is to say, the poor got poorer while everyone else did alright. However, by the 90s this trend had stabilized, and since then, 90-50 inequality has been rising instead. That is to say, the riches began to pull away from everybody else. The composition of income changes too. Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman find that in the 70s and 80s, rising inequality was driven by rising wages at the top, but since the 2000s, the top 1% have been deriving more and more of their income from capital, like stocks, rather than wage earnings. In fact, they find that since the late 1990s, top 1% labor income has declined as a fraction of national income. Instead, all the increase in the top 1% income share in recent years owes to an upsurge in capital income, as you can see in figure 8. Top 1% labor income rapidly increases from the 70s through the 90s, but starting in the 2000s their wages stagnate, and instead capital income begins to increase rapidly. Purcell also identifies this divergence. Average wages increase until about the year 2000, and then stop growing. The CRS data, you may recall, shows the same. Before 2000, wages of the most poorly educated drop, while everyone else sees wages rise. 
But after 2000, the wages for almost everyone, including many of the educated, flatlined. We can therefore say that since 1980, there have actually been two separate trends which have created what Otto Katz and Kearney call income polarization. The 80s and 90s, when the poorest and least educated see their incomes decline, but everyone else sees at least modest improvements. And the 2000s onwards, where everybody's wages flatline, including the top 1%, with nearly all income growth confined to the retired and those that own lots of capital. In short, compensation began to decline for many Americans as early as 40 years ago, and stagnated for pretty much everybody starting about 20 years ago. Broadly speaking, there's two competing theories on what actually happened here. The first one is skills-biased technological change, or SBTC for short. This is the hypothesis generally advocated by Otto Katz and Kearney, for example. New technologies, specifically the rise of computers, act as complements for high skill tasks, but substitutes for middle skill tasks. That is to say, computers make people at the very top, like doctors or bankers, more productive and hence increase their pay, but also replace a lot of middle-income clerical work that was previously done by those with high school diplomas or some college. As evidence, they cite changes in employment growth by occupational skill as calculated by the US Department of Labor. They find that in the 80s, employment only declined for the least skilled jobs, and rose for everybody else, which corresponds to our earlier point about the 80s being a period of decline for the lowest earning but modest growth for everybody else. However, as computers enter the workplace between 1990 and 2000, they find that employment of the lowest skilled is actually stable, and demand for those at the top of the skill hierarchy actually increases, while the middle sees big declines in employment. This corresponds to Taylor and Omer's findings, which identify a dualism in US employment since 1990, with a growing proportion of the US workforce employed in low productivity, low wage sectors like food service and logistics. Between 1990 and 2016, they find that the total employment share of low wage sectors rose from 47% to 61%, suggesting that as middle income jobs dried up, many Americans were forced into low pay sectors, including warehousing, entertainment, and healthcare. These low productivity sectors also had low average work hours, with average hours in accommodation and food as low as 26 hours a week. The SBTC conclusion is that rising inequality is inevitable due to technological changes in the economy, and the best we can do is redistribute wealth with taxation to the economic losers after the fact. The other main theory is institutional, the claim that deliberate changes in policy and transformations in the structure of work are the causes of stagnating wages and rising inequality. This includes factors like the minimum wage, the decline of unions, and changes in monopoly and worker power more broadly. Even SBTC theorists concede that institutional factors play a role. For example, Otto Katz and Kearney admit that their first transformation, the decline of the bottom 10% against everybody else, was almost certainly due to a collapse in the real minimum wage across the 1980s, though they also claim that later changes were largely due to computerization. More recent research has confirmed that institutional changes, rather than technological ones, are more important. Crystal and Cohen deploy a fixed effect regression model to decompose the association of rising wage inequality within firms and industries with both computerization and a range of other indicators, including the minimum wage level, union density, demographic changes, and other factors. In contrast to SBTC, they find that a combination of a falling real minimum wage and declining unionization are responsible for over half of rising wage inequality from 1969 to 2012. They find that from 1969 to 1997, a declining minimum wage was the single most important factor, which corresponds to Otto Katz and Kearney's conclusion about rising inequality between the bottom and everybody else in the 80s. However, they also find that in the period from 1988 to 2012, half of the total increase in wage inequality is due to the declining presence of unions, which fell by over half nationally over the same period. Computerization is important, but it's a secondary factor, and actually becomes less significant as time passes. These results explain two facts that never meshed well with SBTC. Firstly, computerization occurred to a similar degree in Europe, and yet wage inequality grew much more slowly there. 
Secondly, computerization varies between industries, with lots of computers used in manufacturing, but relatively few in food service, for example. And yet Crystal and Cohen find that wage inequality primarily grew within and not between industries. SBTC cannot explain these facts, but declining unions and minimum wages can. Notably, Crystal, Cohen, and Navet find that the same is true for benefits. The decline of labor unions, along with the liberalization of employment practices, by which they mean more part-time and contract work, partly account for why benefit inequality increased at more than twice the rate of wage inequality. Given that Piketty finds that benefits have gradually replaced wages as a share of total U.S. worker compensation, this has pretty important implications. This brings us to our last paper, published in 2020 by Anna Stansbury and Larry Summers. That's right, that Larry Summers, the one who's been railing against student loan cancellation and fear-mongering about inflation for a year now. Despite Summers' conservative leanings, the paper comes to a surprising conclusion. The authors conclude that the most dominant trend of the last 40 years is a decline in worker power, resulting in a redistribution of product market rents from labor to capital owners. Across over a hundred pages of statistical analysis, the authors test and reject a range of alternative theories. First of all, some have argued that pressures from globalization and free trade have made economic times difficult, forcing companies to cut costs to stay afloat, especially labor costs. But the authors find that 73% of the decline in labor rents or the economic surplus allocated to labor, came from industries where returns to capital rose. That is to say, where companies became more profitable. The authors also find a similar decline in worker power across industries independent of import penetration, suggesting free trade was not an important factor. Figure 8 demonstrates the actual trend quite well. The total economic surplus generated by companies is about flat over time, perhaps declining slightly but the capital share of that surplus pretty clearly increases, especially in the early 2000s. Remember, the early 2000s is precisely when we saw wages stagnate in the CRS report. Similar to Crystal and Cohen's finding that wage inequality grew largely within and not between industries, Stansbury and Summers report that worker power, especially unionization, has declined similarly across most industries, suggesting that technological change like computerization is not an adequate explanation. Overall, they conclude that the proportional decline in the unionization rate from the mid-1980s to the mid-2000s was almost identical across a range of sectors which had very different exposures to globalization, technological change, and deregulation over the period, and the rate of unionization has declined much more quickly in the US than in most other industrialized economies, despite similar trends in globalization and technology. Altogether, this indicates that domestic institutional changes affecting worker power, especially the decline of unions, is responsible for stagnating wages, far more than computerization, globalization, free trade, or any other explanation. A lot of rhetoric and existing policy on inequality revolves around redistribution, taxing the rich and helping out everybody else. This is important, but what our last paper highlights is that even more critical are policies to boost worker power to demand higher wages in the first place, what political scientist Jacob Hacker calls pre-distributive policies, or government rules that determine the distribution of income before taxation and redistribution. An international comparison is useful here. Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman compare the average real income of the bottom 50% in the US and France. Both countries saw rapid economic growth in the 90s and early to mid 2000s, with the bottom 50% seeing some pretty substantial real income gains in that period. However, in the US, basically all of that progress was erased by the Great Recession. In fact, average incomes of the bottom 50% kept dropping for several years after the recession ended. In contrast, France did then go through a period of economic stagnation but their bottom 50% were able to hold on to their earlier income gains. As a result, by 2014, average income for the bottom 50% in France was actually higher than the US, despite American per capita GDP being nearly 30% higher in that same year. 
Between 1980 and 2014, average bottom 50% incomes in France had risen about 35%. In the US, it had flatlined. France, of course, has much stronger unions, as well as better legal protections for workers, providing evidence for Stansbury and Summers' conclusion. Before wrapping up, I want to note that there are some important gaps we didn't have time to cover, like analyzing the role of finance in all of this, or what actually caused unions to decline in the US to begin with. There's also some problems with adjusting figures to inflation over long time periods. Different methods give quite different results, leading to issues with data validity. Nevertheless, we can conclude that the EPI chart we presented at the beginning of this video is a roughly correct, if very oversimplified, projection of the state of things in America over the last four decades, and we have further identified rising inequality, itself caused by falling worker power and declining unions, as the primary cause. Thanks for watching.